Hi, everyone. Hey, so how's everyone enjoying the event and today? Yeah, it's, it's a lot. This is an amazing gathering. So I'm going to begin a little differently from many of our sessions by reading from the, the preface for my new, for the new preface for the book Water in Plain Sight. The weather report promised sunshine, but Valencia, Spain greets us with thunder and heavy rain. Water splashes on the sidewalks. Older women in sturdy shoes shake out their umbrellas, taking refuge in cafes. The forecasters never get it right on the Mediterranean side because they don't consider the effects of the sea temperature, explains Mian Mian, the Spanish meteorologist and atmospheric physicist I have come to visit. Mian identifies the weather system as a levanter, the Spanish coast's equivalent of a nor'easter, in which cold continental air encounters warm water, and the result prompts intense precipitation. This typically plays itself out once the Mediterranean cools off, he says. He notes that as the sea has warmed some two degrees Celsius in the last 30 years, the region has experienced longer lasting storms later into the season. They used to end in October. Now they go all the way until June. I reluctantly pocket my sunglasses and zip my rain jacket up to my chin. Mian, who until retirement led the Center for Environmental Studies of the Mediterranean, that's C-E-A-M for those who collect acronyms, is a longtime student of water climate dynamics. On this edge of Spain that he knows so well, he can observe the movement of clouds and shifts of wind and estimate the arrival of rain within the hour. Over the past several decades, he has documented the loss of the daily summer storms that once brought cool nights, cleansed the air, filled the aquifers, and were not so heavy as to spark flooding. He attributes their disappearance to development along the coast, specifically the loss of vegetation and soil, which has altered the hydrological cycle. Mian speaks to the nuances of air and moisture flow with terms of the trade such as advection, anticyclone, and inversion. To a layperson, it's like this. Urbanization, the draining of marshes, and the loss of forest cover has diminished water recycling in the western Mediterranean basin. As a result, the accumulated moisture piles up in layers over the sea or moves inland, causing torrential rains and mudslides elsewhere on the continent, such as those that have been hammering Central Europe, or out-of-season storms, like the one we are now contending with in usually sunny Valencia, squishing in our boots. Mian's research highlights a crucial insight that has yet to hit prime time. Our use of the land influences climate, and the vehicle for this is water. Okay, so if I were reading this and giving this to you, I would be highlighting that line. Climate change has two legs, one on the ground and one in the air, he says. Land use changes alter the hydrological system, and this has immediate impacts on climate. He calls the current focus on greenhouse gases convenient, Al Gore's iconic phrase notwithstanding. You can track CO2 a lot and do nothing about it. What he means is that CO2 is abstract and meaningful change depends on large entities like governments and industry. Land use, on the other hand, is linked to where we live, what we eat, and how we move, the stuff of daily life. Understanding our individual and collective impact on the land prompts us to take responsibility on a deeper level and to make deeper changes. And yet, herein lies opportunity. Restoring the ecology in pivotal locations can reinstate water circulation and revive long-standing weather patterns. According to Mian, strategically revegetating a small expanse of land can make a significant difference in the surrounding region. So when I talked to him, it was something like 
10 square kilometers, 10 by 10 kilometers, but then he felt uncomfortable pinning down a, you know, a particular area because there are so many variables. Anyway, this is an introduction to the topic, which is climate and water. So I, I wrote this book, Water in Plain Sight, for two reasons. One is that whenever people were talking about water challenges, such as floods or often drought, and this was during the years of the California drought, I guess like 2014, 2015, the focus was always about what did or didn't come down from the sky. No one talked about the land. No one talked about soil degradation, which is a part of the story. And that made me nuts. So having just written a book about soil, I wanted to really bring home the connection between the soil and the water cycle. And I don't know whether people here have used this metric, but for every, so when you restore the, so, the soil and you're building soil, building carbon-rich soil, every 1% increase in soil organic carbon, so going from 1% to 2%, that represents an added 25,000 gallons per acre that can be held on the land. I mean, that alone is huge. That is huge resilience in the face of floods because as a friend of mine likes to say, it makes it that much more difficult to make a flood. If all the water is soaking in happily, it's hard to make a flood. And then also, you can last longer between, between waterings and the system keeps, keeps going and, this, and also in drier or warmer climates, like climates when you have a rainy season and a dry season, you could extend the period of green growth, which means you have more photosynthesis happening longer into the season. So the water-soil connection is really strong. And the other reason that I was determined to write this book, and believe me, you, you, you need a lot of motivation to write a book. It's you know, you're living with that thing for many years. <laughs> so, um, and you're sitting at the computer and it's, you know, it's, 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 it's both fun. Was I about to say joyous? I mean, there are, there are high points. Hanging out with me on Miao is pretty fun. Um, but anyway, it's a lot. So the other reason that I wanted to write this book is that when we talk about the connection between water and climate, usually the conversation goes in one direction, and that is the effect that climate change will have on water resources throughout the world, or how climate change will intensify and make more frequent extreme water-related weather events like floods. So I felt that there was this huge not only opportunity, but almost obligation. Let's look at the other side of that equation. Let's look at how water influences climate. And the fact, because that really hasn't been part of the climate conversation. So um, there's a soil micro, an Australian soil microbiologist named Walter Yenna, who has really kind of woken many of us up to this dynamic. And he explains that our climate is, that what drives our climate is 95% of what drives our climate is hydrological processes. And once you kind of let that in, I mean, because the climate, the CO2 narrative is so pervasive in our, in our culture, not that CO2 isn't important, I'm not going there, and not that we don't have to do something about it, but we've got this leverage with the, with the water cycle, that we can work with the water cycle to enhance nature's climate regulation capacity. So I'm going to tell you some stories about that from my reporting and see where we go from there. First of all, just to get in the mood of water, this, I'll have you know, is the world champion stone skipper. And this is our local lake in North Bennington, Vermont. And my husband took this picture because he's really impressed. 
this guy is in the Guinness Book of World Records for 88 stone skips. Now, just for a little family brag, um, my husband did place both second and third in the amateur stone skipping. I think he got over 20, but the real bummer of that is that now he has to compete against the pros. I, I don't know. He gets sponsors and things. I, he seems to, he's a physicist. He seems to make a kind of career of this, but he is, he can tell his grandchildren that he's in the Guinness Book of World Records, and you know, that is worth something. I understand that there is a bit of an art to that, and, but but they do, and um, yeah, I don't know, 88. And then I just wanna say that dealing with this topic actually was a lot more fun when the impacts that I was talking about were more theoretical and not actual. This is this week in Venice. I mean, that just blows one's mind. And it's really concerning the impacts that, that we are seeing in the water, in our water cycle. But it also really points to just how urgently we need to start broadening our thinking about how to address climate change and really becoming more water literate, I would say. So another thing that, that Mian Mian, my Spanish guide, said is that what we're seeing now so when, when people talk about climate change, you know, like, okay, so something like this happens, all right? So this is reported in the media, and then the me people in the media say, well, can we say that this is because of climate change? Or someone will say, well, this is because of climate change. And that's very vague to make the connection. So if the climate change narrative is all about CO2, well, wait, because there's too much there, there's too much CO2 up there, and so this happens, it's a little hard to make that connection. What Mian Mian says is that what we're seeing now are local impacts, are manifestations of distorted water cycles kind of really intensifying, but on a local or regional level. I just think that's worth at least having that, having that discussion because when it's big in the whole globe, we all feel helpless because there's not much we can do. But if we can work locally and regionally to build our soils so that more water soaks in and it doesn't run off, and you've got more biological systems kept going and nourished by that water, then you can start to do something about it. So, you know, basically, the point is that if you're wondering what I'm doing here at a soil and nutrition conference, is that managing the water cycle is really all about the soil. And we can think about the soil as our water infrastructure. There's a, a source of mine, a colleague named Brock Dahlman, and I love how he talks about water. He won, runs something called the Water Institute in California, in Sonoma County and at the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center. And he talks about the difference between, he talks about what we usually think of as water infrastructure as the pipe shed. You know, we think that water can't really move unless we're like moving it around via pipes and dams and culverts and all of that. But we really can think about, about soil as, the, uh, as our water infrastructure. As I was, looking into water and climate and, and water and how it interacts with biodiversity and food security and um, peace and conflict and all, all of these things. I, I, it occurred to me that the way that we often talk about water is as a noun, like it, it's this thing that's bounded in place. You know, do we have enough water? How big is this aquifer? How, just how, how much? How, and not as much about water processes, just as an example. I remember that there was this headline during the California drought when people were really getting concerned in 2014, 2015, because half of the nation's produce 
comes out of the Central Valley of California. So everyone was, you know, when is the rain going to come? When is the rain going to come? And there was an article with a very snappy headline. It said that in order to get past the drought, California needs 11 trillion Olympic-sized swimming pools worth of water, worth of rain. And that just made me laugh because if you have degraded soil, then you could have an, a lot of covered ground with, with parking lots and, and buildings and, and rooftops and all of that and sidewalks. Then you could have all that rain or even more and it's just going to fall, you know, it's just going to fall to the ground. It's going to run off degraded soil. It's going to run through across the parking lots, picking up pollutants as it goes and all the way down into the sea. And you will be back in drought mode soon enough. On the other hand, if you have well aggregated organic matter rich soil, well, you probably don't need all that 11 trillion swimming pools worth of water, maybe of rainfall. Maybe you only need, say, a few billion kiddie pools worth because the, the rainfall will be more effective. So I focus a lot on different water processes, okay? And I'll share that with you with examples from my reporting. And basically, infiltration, transpiration, and condensation. So, how many of you know this fellow? Okay, a few of you. Alan Savory, or many of you. Alan Savory. So, I had the incredible privilege of spending more than a week in Dimbengombe, the Dimbengombe Ranch in Zimbabwe. And just being, spending time with Alan was really incredible. Let me just, I'll just frame. Um, Alan Savory is the wildlife biologist, thinker, philosopher from Zimbabwe who kind of codified holistic management. And holistic management is a decision-making approach that is often applied to, to managing livestock. What he was able to do in Dimbengombe with the water cycle was, re was all done by livestock. But spending time with him was really extraordinary because I have never seen met anyone who was so attuned to the land because he, he was an expert tracker. And he could look at the land and, and say, a giraffe was here yesterday and it was going that way toward water. Um, it, was, it was really special. And also, just as an aside, he's now in his 80s and he still walks around barefoot. And it's not an affectation, well, maybe a little, but he, he walks around barefoot because he wants to get information about the land, about whether it's compacted, about what's, what kind of cover, and, and he can f just get a lot of information that way. Although in Zimbabwe, it gets really hot. I, we, were there, we were there in September, so that's their spring, but it gets really hot, so in the middle of the day, he will reluctantly put on a pair of shoes, usually some old kudu leather shoes that have clearly seen better days. He must have had them for about 50 years. <laughs> so so this, is, this is the Dimbengobe River. And through holistic plan grazing, they were able to stabilize the banks so that you wouldn't get the erosion and the topsoil running off and the river silting up and, and all of that. They were able to stabilize the banks and hold more water in the ground to get more vegetation. And so there would be, the whole system was more stable. They were able to increase this river so that it ran more than a kilometer higher up into the catchment and it started running throughout the year. In the past, it had dried out during, the dry, during the, the dry season, and that meant that the elephants, the neighborhood elephants, had to travel very far to find water. 
But since they've been doing this work, or it took about 10, 15 years, the elephants could you know, just wallow anywhere. Last year was a really, really bad drought year in Zimbabwe, so it, didn't, it did dry up for, for a time period. However, their land still produced a lot of grass, and you know, the land itself was, was really, really functional compared to the, to the game reserve right next door. And next door, well, you know, to the side. And it is a really, they can, they can really tell the efficacy of what they're doing because they do have national parkland right next to it. So when we were visiting, Alan showed us like where the detritus, where the like little bits of flotsam and, and wood flowed during the rainy season. Because when it rains, I mean, it's really dry, but when it rains, it really, really rains. And on the national park side, it was way high up. So the water came three meters up. Whereas on the Africa Center for Holistic Management side, it was much lower. And Alan said, because we, we were in a, in a vehicle, you know, we'd gotten out of the vehicle, and he said, if we were on the parkland side, this vehicle would be underwater. You know, and when you're standing there next to a tall Jeep, that really does make it more vivid. So you could, you could see the difference that, that, that this made. And that's what did it, was the strategic movement of the animals so that none of the land was overgrazed and none of the land was undergrazed. So do I, so this is about six in the morning. And I remember it was pleasant out, but it wasn't as much that it was cool as it was not yet hot. You know, you could just feel that it was kind of revving up to be a scorcher. Now, on the human side of this, we went to several villages that were, work, that were working with the Africa Center, and they were so thrilled to share with us their stories, and they were so happy about the work that they were doing because, all right, going back to water, infiltration. Because of the, the building of the soil through the movement of the animals who release their, you know, add their waste and they would press down seeds so that they had a chance to germinate. And so they could also press in the, soil, the, the dying plant material so that it could be built back into the soil by the microbiology. Because of all of those processes, the land held the water the land infiltrated the water to a much higher degree. And they did a little bit of research on that. And I think that they figured out exactly what, what, that, what that was. But what this meant for the people who lived there is that rather than being able to grow crops for two and a half months out of the year, which is how, how it had been basically around the rainy season, because the water infiltrated and they could hold that moisture in, they were able to grow crops for seven months out of the year. And for these communities, that meant the difference between being on international food aid and being self-sufficient. And what they told us was that now other villages come to them for food. And the suffering that these people had in Sienyanga and Sizinda, this is a photo of um, a woman who was running the um, market garden in Sizinda, just the hardships that because there was no water, they would have to move their animals 10, 20 kilometers to get water. And maybe they took five cattle and because of the people they encountered or maybe the lions that they encountered, they might come back with two. So their quality of life was dramatically increased because the water infiltrated. Also, biodiversity. So these are sable antelope and they are just so beautiful to see in the wild. This photo was taken just a few, literally a few steps away from the Africa Center main area. We were taking a little bushwalk. And while we were there, we saw several, and driving around, we saw several healthy herds 
of sable antelope with young, and that's a really good sign. Unfortunately, in southern Africa, the number of sable antelope is diminishing, and the scientists, let's say at the Kruger Park in South Africa, they say that they don't know why. But what we do know is that these animals thrive when there is a diversity of grasses for, for camouflage and what they graze on, and that that's the habitat where they thrive in. And here at the Africa Center, they do now have a variety of, of, of grasses, really healthy grass. So that was beautiful to see. And water and biodiversity have a really interesting relationship. So sure, it makes sense that when you have a healthy water cycle, that that supports more biodiversity. But what I found also was that biodiversity actually supports the water cycle. All sorts of forms of life, be they beavers or earthworms or in the southwest prairie dogs, they are, and dung beetles, they are carving out space for water to flow slowly through the soil profile so that water doesn't rush through. And it's holding the water. It's another means of in infiltrating that water. And then all the other ways that biodiversity support the ecosystem, just that you'll have um, deep-rooted grasses that allow for the water flow, you know, keeps the soil aggregated down to the roots and water flows deeper down into the soil profile and into aquifers and anyway. Um, it, it works both ways, and that's just a reminder that that tends to be how nature works. Now to transpiration. Okay, so this is, I chose this photo. Basically, transpiration is the upward movement of water through plants, and it's really, really powerful, and we hardly ever hear about it. So in another talk, I was hearing how people say, well, we can think of plants a plant as a pump. And they were talking about the carbon, about how through photosynthesis, carbon compounds are created and sent down through the roots. That's the liquid carbon pathway down to the roots. And that's where they, all this underground barter happens when the additional carbon is traded for different nutrients and um, you know, get, getting connected to the mycelial network and, and all of that, all of that trading that happens. But we can also think about a plant as a pump in terms of water, because water does go down into the plant. Water also moves up through the plant. This photo, I think this is in Morocco, this is from the search engine called, just a little plug, Ecosia. Do all of you know about the search engine? Okay, okay, I'm, I'm really glad. Anyway, I recommend it whenever I can. So it's a search engine that rather than taking the, the little tiny bits of fractions of, of a cent per search and putting it into someone's pocket, they use it to plant trees and they do so they, they really study the environment. They have a very high bar for their projects. It's not just, let's just put any old tree anywhere. Um, they're, really, they're really good, and I, I saw a project that they were working on in Spain. So uh, I just wanted to mention them. Um, yeah, so the thing about transpiration that's really powerful is that it is a cooling mechanism. So you know, so we've got water in its wet state moving into vapor because the plant sends it out as vapor. What that's doing is that it's dissipating heat. So let's say that you, so whenever, you know how it feels cool around plants? Well, partly you know, that's because the like trees provide shade but it's also because of that transpiration, all of that cooling that's going on. Because we know that when you boil water, that takes a lot of energy to move water from a liquid state to a vaporous state. 
So the cooling is tremendous. One botanist who really talks a lot about, about transpiration is named Jan Picorni. So he's part of this group of Eastern Europeans who wrote an incredible book called Water for the Recovery of the Climate, the New Water Paradigm. And it's free for a down, you can download it for free. It's about 90 pages. And it's available in English or in the original Slovakian. So I will leave it to you, what's, <laughs> what's easier for you to read. But when I read that, it really totally blew my mind. So what Jan Picorni point, says is that like the cooling power of one good-sized tree on a typical sunny summer day is five times that of an air conditioner in a fancy hotel guest room. So what happens is you get solar radiation coming down. I mean, this, this is climate. I mean, when, what I encourage people to, to do to, to, when, to think about climate, so we've, we've gotten into this, into this CO2 narrative, which, as I said, is important, but it's almost as if we're getting the message that the climate of the Earth is this static thing, and like you turn the CO2 dial up or down, and that determines what kind of climate we get. How can we possibly think that something so complex and drawing on so many different variables could possibly be that simple? So I like to pose the question, how does the Earth manage heat? And one really important way is through transpiration. So in a very basic level, when we're dealing with, with climate change and warming, we're dealing with what do we do with the energy from the sun. When, let's say you've got a patch of bare soil, it's just been like, you know, industrial farming has had its way with it and just pummeled the life out of it, all right? And th the sun beams down on that area. It, it just becomes sensible heat because there's nothing there to mediate that heat. Whereas when you have plants, the plants are mediating that heat. They're dissipating it. They're turning it from heat, you know, from the solar radiant heat to latent heat embodied in the water vapor. And what happens is many things happen to that. So that is part of the small water cycle. And then often it goes further up into the, into the atmosphere. So you've cooled, you've, act, you've, you've cooled the area on which, around which live, the surface of the ground and kind of where we hang out. It's a tremendous opportunity, you know, to, to really focus on how can we give any play, piece of land more opportunities to cool. Now to condensation. So we could think about condensation as the meteorological mirror of transpiration. So, you know, we know what goes up must come down. But what happens with condensation, with transpiration, the, the mo water molecules are expanded and kind of, you know, put into vapor. Here they condense. And this photo, which is from a really wonderful organization called We Forest. They have fabulous scientific papers that call attention to all the various phenomenon around the water cycle and how forests interact with water. And I'll get a little bit more into that. So, so it condenses, forms clouds, and then you get rain. So when you have a really highly functioning ecosystem, you get this small water cycle where the same water, the same drops are basically cycling around and around and around. So in a functioning tropical rainforest, that's, that's what you get. The other thing, the other way that forests and condensation interact is that every, so every raindrop needs something to condense around. Okay, we'd like to think of rain as pure, 
but no, you need some stuff. You need um, something, uh, a nuclei, a precipitation nuclei. And it just so happens that healthy vegetation is really important in creating those nuclei, in, in offering them up. So there's bacteria in different plants, and there's aerosols in, from trees. So you're getting all of these different substances that are creating opportunities for water to condense. And it turns out, um, at what Walter Yena talks about, is that what happens when we have large areas that have been devegetated, we have all this eroding soil creating dust. And that dust, unfortunately, yeah, they're particles, but they are too small for to, to be hydroscopic, to attract water. Aerosols, um, it's particles that are up in the air. So in the air all around us is different substances and dust, dust from the rug. If I stamp on the rug, there'll be dust particles and yeah, and substances from, you know, from the ground. So, so the ones from trees, you know, I think about this, this Brazilian biologist, who, um, Antonio Nobre, he calls it fairy dust. You know, it's like this magic dust that creates rain. So, so they're, they're different kinds of, of particles. Bacteria, ice crystals. I, I forget what it was that comes from the ocean. I, I, f I forget what it is, some kind of little, little crystals. The salts. And so do those become, that becomes um, condensation nuclei. Yeah, so there's all these dynamics going on. And I mean, the people at We Forest, they talk, you know how we talk about a watershed? They talk about a precipitation shed, about you know, the area where the, you've got rain coming down and particles going up and uh, in, in a healthy system. Also condensation is that you can work with it. So this is a water tank. This is a famous water tank in far west Texas. So there's a couple that they, ba they virtually farm with dew. So we don't really think about dew as being terribly important because we think that the quantity is so small. But I've heard a number of people say that for a farmer, these are people from Australia who are dealing with a very dry system, that dew is the most predictable moisture and therefore the most important. The way another Australian farmer puts it is that by holding on to the water a little bit longer, you're keeping the microbial life going longer into the day. Just a little bit more opportunity for all of that life. Now, my um, friends Marcus and Catherine Otmers, they designed their home in this really brutally dry, hot area of far west Texas named Terlingua. It's right at the edge of Big Bend. Has anyone been around in that area? I still remember the, the, that there was a, a common bumper sticker that the local people had. Terlingua, Texas, hotter in hell and cooler in shit. You know, so like that, that was the tone. And everybody that I met in, in the area said, oh, what's gonna get us here is the lack of water. You know, there are signs everywhere. Don't, you know, be careful how much water you use. Now, th this couple, they built a rain barn. They built a building that was designed to capture condensation. And so it was the way that they, that it, they angled it so that they had a, differ a really high differential between the heat, the, he the absorbed heat on the metal roof and then the cooler air at night that would come in and that would create condensation. And then it would roll down into the pipe and into their water tank. They had no idea just how much water they were harvesting until the day in January, four months after the last rainfall, when the water tank overflowed. And Marcus thought, okay, okay, there must be something wrong with the tank, maybe it's not you know, maybe there's a blockage or something. So he got up at four o'clock in the morning the next day 
And sure enough, the water was flowing into the water tank. So that was really something. And just as an aside, what Marcus modeled his whole rain barn on, I mean, he's really quite an interesting guy, is the Namib beetle. Have you heard about this beetle in um, Namibia, in this, the Namib Desert, which is like one of the driest parts of the earth? And creatures have evolved to thrive there. So there's this beetle that when the sea winds come, it, go, it like goes onto its hands, its, its you know, front tentacles, and then catches the moisture on its belly and beads of moisture will go into its mouth. So he studied this beetle, like, okay, what angle? And anyway, it's quite a production. Now I'm moving, I'm giving you some sneak previews into the next book. All right, so the next book that is now, I, I just finished, I just finished the, writing the book. It's about the, the growing global ecosystem restoration movement. And one of my inspirations is sitting right over there, John Liu. I don't know if you all have met John. I think he's talking tomorrow. Sorry, John, I know you're actually shy. But anyway, hi, John. Um, yeah, um, John really has sparked great interest in ecological restoration and really keeping that front and center. And, and my first chapter is about John, John's story. So, so, in, in this book, I'm looking at some pretty challenging environments where people were able to do incredible work on restoring ecosystems. This is in Western Saudi Arabia. And there is a fellow named Neil Spackman, who's a really interesting guy. He's an American. And through an, some, just kind of by chance, he happened, to, he ended up learning Arabic. That became his, he went to college when there was, a, after 9-11, he wanted to understand what went on, what are these cultures, why don't these cultures understand each other, so he studied Arabic. And, you know, he became a translator. In the meantime, he was reading about permaculture, reading about natural building, kind of building this other line of interest. And there was a project that was looking for an Arabic speaker to develop the ecological side of a community revitalization project. So this is the al Baida project in Western Saudi Arabia. And he, they got a 100 hectare site and there was very, very little life there, but I mean, this is a place where it may go a couple of years without any rain, okay? This is a pretty challenging environment. But he got a team together of local people, local Bedouins, and they created earthworks, small check dams, so that they could be ready when it rained. So when the rain came, they planted. They planted like crazy and they planted thousands of trees. They selected the trees for that ecosystem. They looked back historically what had been there. And what was interesting is that this was a desolate area, but what he said is that any time he met anyone over the age of, say, 60, almost invariably, like 90% of the time, those people could remember from their childhood that there was always a place that they could go where there was shade and there was water. The story that he tells about what happened is that in 1952, the Saudi Arabian government changed the rules about land ownership. In the past, there had been, the, been this system called HIMA, which was this whole like multi-layered kind of set of ethics where everybody would have access to this land to graze their cattle, and then they would move with the seasons. But no matter how poor you were, you were taken care of. Then, all of that land was taken over by the Saudi Arabian government, 
And what that, ha what that led to was a kind of grazing free-for-all. So when it rained, people from two hours away from Mecca and um, I forget the other, uh, Jeddah, would truck in their herds. And the local people maybe had 10 to 12 camels and goats and, and like that. But these people were very wealthy with their trucks. And they would have 150 animals. So they would just let their animals out. And then they would eat up all the grass and then go. And then you know, it, it was grazed down to the ground. It was overgrazed. And the local people then, in order to maintain their way of life, they needed to make money otherwise, in another way, whereas they had this kind of sustainable system where they were living by their, by their herds, they needed to buy food for their animals. And the way that they bought, they were able to buy food was they were chopping down trees to sell for firewood. So this is a, a policy that just led to incredible land degradation and incredible suffering. I mean, that's why, uh, so, so most of the people in, in, in this area are on public assistance, which is why this, this residential and ecological project was started. Anyway, let's see what it looks like. This, I think, was in 2010. Let's see what it looked like last week. Okay, yeah, it's, it's really pretty incredible. I think, I, I think we have another picture. Oh, yeah, this, you know, they were blocking the, the water and holding the water, and yeah, no, that's really lush. You would not guess that that was Saudi Arabia. So I didn't get many um, pictures of the trees, but so what was interesting there is that they planted all these trees. Okay, that was one of the things. Oh, yes, yeah, so when, when it rained, they, they, they planted, and they had an irrigation system, and what's really important about the irrig irrigation system is that they were very mindful of what they took out, that they never removed and used for irrigation any more water than they were, that they were able to capture. And that's really important in a, in a country like this because, I mean, it's crazy. Like, there's a huge wheat industry in Saudi Arabia that is based on water taken from the aquifer, you know, and the aquifers are almost dry. You know, it's 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 not looking so good for the for the future there. But so so th so they they kept within their water budget. So they planted all these trees and everything was looking really good. And then in 2016, they ran out of funding for the ecological side of the project. So, you know, Neil's reaction was, and everyone's reaction was, well, I guess we'll have to see what happens. And the amazing thing is that what happened was. 80% of the trees survived. The, and the next three years after that, I think it was, yeah, there was, no, there, there was no rainfall. I think it was two years. I remember him telling me three years, but if it was 2016, so I know that they got rain recently, but before that, they, all those trees, 80% of those trees survived. So that gives them incredible information about within a species, which trees do survive and which don't. And so, you know, taking the genetics from the ones that do and on seeing which produce, which, which survive but fruit, but don't fruit, which fruit. So, yeah, no, I mean, it's a, it's a really, really in, incredible project. And then the other side of that is biodiversity, that he said that as they were holding the water in the landscape, they started seeing ants. I mean, he said that you never think that you're not going to see ants, but they hadn't. Ants and termites and bats and pigeons and mushrooms. And where had, there had been one type of mushroom that would show up after rainfall, now there were f five different varieties. So yeah, so it's really, it's really recharging that whole ecological system. And here, that's Mian Mian in his natural habitat in Spain. And Mian Mian took me on a journey that he had also taken John to, on. When you go up into the, the hills, kind of past, you go past the continental divide, because you've got a, a Mediterranean kind of hydrological system, 
and then, or precipitation shed, and then you have the Atlantic precipitation sh shed. So he took me up and could show where the vegetation had been taken away and then where the, where the rain line kept moving up as vegetation had been removed. What's really important of, or what I, what I thought really interesting about his research in the Western Mediterranean is that he really, he really made the connection between what we do to the land and what happens to the rain, which is the, local, the regional climate. So there, as I mentioned, as I, as I read earlier, that there had been these regular summer rains. He said it was clockwork, that every afternoon the clouds would roll in and you'd get a rainfall and it clean, cleaned the air. And that, that was, the, that was the, the weather system that everybody knew and depended on and planted according to. So with all of the draining of the marshes and building on this you know, beautiful coastal land, there wasn't as much, so with the loss of vegetation, what he found is that clearly you, you were also losing the, trans, the transpiration. And what he came to measure is that you needed a particular concentration of moisture in order to get a rainfall. So you had evaporation from the Mediterranean, which was giving you, I think it was like 16 units of moisture, you know, grams per whatever, um, thank you, grams per kilogram of air. With, when the land had vegetation, you were getting an additional, you needed an additional seven grams of moisture per kilogram of air. And when you had the plants, you were getting enough through transpiration to keep that weather system going, to get the precipitation. But when you lost the, the plant cover, then you weren't, they weren't getting what, they, what was needed to create rain, so that would keep wafting up until, you know, eventually you would get enough moisture and then it would rain. So there we are in Spain. So this is, I, I, I want to bring this home. This is just a, 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 a way to bring a lot of this together. So, so here on the right, that's desertification, all right? And so you've got water moving horizontally as opposed to moving down. And also, you've got water evaporating, so you could also have a, an arrow going up, and CO2 going up, because with the, with the ground uncovered, then the carbon is oxidizing and going up into the atmosphere. Then on the other side, you've got water going into the ground. So this is well-managed, holistically managed grazing rangeland. You've got water going down and being held. You've got carbon going into the soil and building the soil. And you've got a virtuous cycle. So the more carbon that you get in the soil, the more water can be held. And that's why you get all this beautiful vegetation and these guys with the really cool cowboy hats. So with this other one, you get a, a, a vicious cycle because the water evaporates or runs off, and without plant cover, not only are you not getting more transpiration, but the soil surface is heating up. And they talk about soil skin temperature because, because the surface of the soil can get much hotter, quicker than the, than, than the ambient temperature would be. And that's really important because above a certain temperature in the soil, you start losing soil life. So over, I think, I think at, at 70 degrees centigrade, like 90% of the moisture you get is going to feed the plant. And then you start losing that moisture as you, as more, as you get to a higher temperature and it evaporates, and above 
I think 100, starting 115 degrees Fahrenheit, the soil microbiology begins to, to die. So this vicious cycle, because you have less soil life, it's even harder for plants to get going, and, you, and the soil continues to degrade, and you lose more water. Anyway, I, th I, th I think you get it. Now, what I like to point out is that if you look at that picture of the degraded landscape, you might see that, like, on, you know, on a news clip, and that might be described as the result of climate change. And what I want to bring home here is that it's also a cause of climate change because you're not getting the cooling, because you're losing the carbon and it's, and it's oxidizing, and you're losing the soil life. So desertification is progressing, and that is contributing to the malfunctioning ecological systems and it is functioning ecosystems that help regulate our climate. I mean, we, I know different, different desert areas that people are looking at. Well, you know, the Sahara Desert used to be vegetated. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, there is a, a publication that I wrote called The Holy Grail of Restoration. <laughs> it's Cosmos Magazine. You can Google it and find it. It's free to download. And um, essentially, what it looks like after three years of study is that the whole of North Africa, the East, the Mediterranean, up into Central Asia, has been affected by a shift in. Which brought moisture into the region from over evolutionary time into the region from the Indian Ocean. And that's about 7,000 years ago, approximately. So that's three to 5,000 years after the beginning of the South agriculture in the region. The wind apparently went in the other direction. When you, what she is explaining is that, that uh, when the solar radiation directly hits the surface of the earth, it creates thermal tracks, which send the moisture into the upper atmosphere, and you don't reach critical mass for condensation and precipitation. So when you do that, in, in this particular, in, in, in the particular place where we've been looking, it's not the Sahara, it's the Sinai. Uh, and when we've been looking at the Sinai, it is as and Miyam Miyam, who she's, you showed the picture, is part of the team that's studying this. It is a continental divide. So very similar to this home area around Belize. But when you, when you, do this because of so Mount Sinai is called Mount Sakapa, but that's clearly a kind of colonial name. Um, the from the north you have this movement down to the Mediterranean, and so and then after after massive degradation through human impacts, the thermal drafts made the air and the moisture go into the upper atmosphere, when you computer model that, it's like a vacuum. And when you play a computer model of vacuuming out the moisture <coughs> from the region over 7,000 years, you get the result that we have now, which is this massive desert, desertified area. So it seems there's high probability that human impacts cause all of this to happen. It doesn't look, if you look from the satellites, it doesn't look at all like the rest of the Earth. <clears throat> and then when you think that that is the central, the, the, the cradle of Western civilization, which has spread materialism and the dominant cultural narrative around the world, which is, could cause the same thing in Amazon or the Congo Basin or anywhere where you try 
you're, you need to reverse it. So can we reverse it? Well, I think uh, the work in Saudi Arabia is very helpful in doing that. Right, and Mian Mian's thinking is that by revegetating that area, now what he says is that by revegetating near the, okay, I got you, um, um, the, the area around the Mediterranean, that you can bring back the rains. What he said is that it may, you, it may be that you get rain like 60 kilometers away from where you're revegetating. So that gets a little harder to get people invested in that, in that I idea. But the potential is there. What, what John was talking about, about you know, when, with the thermal drafts and creating a vacuum, it reminds me a couple of weeks ago, I was at, a, at a, a, the Schumacher lectures, actually, and Greg Watson said something really interesting, how we often think in nature that, it, you know, like that a force is pushing something, but often it's a pull, okay? And so one of the dynamics, a group of scientists that I also have been interested in their work, um, have many of you heard of the biotic pump theory? So, so basically when you, so in a, in, in a forest, you've got lots and lots of transpiration happening. So that's putting up moisture, and that creates a low pressure zone which pulls it pulls moisture. So, so this explains how you get rainfall far from the coast. You know, we're just thinking like, oh, you know, water evaporates and then you get rain. But what they talk about is how moisture is pulled inland, closer to where the forests are, often in the higher, higher terrain. No, and, and, and the biotic pump theory, I mean, it's, it's, it is really unnerving now. The chapter where I was discussing these theories was about the Amazon rainforest, you know, and it was lovely to think about, I mean, there was deforestation going on then too at a higher rate than it should have, but to think poetically about the aerial river and, you know, the beauty of the system where there is, over the rainforest, there's five times the moisture embodied in the you know, in the vapor, in the water vapor, um, compared to the Amazon River itself, and then to see what's happening there now is just really, really devastating, because uh, scientists that I talked to back then said that there is a point at which the system can flip. So, yeah, we got to get on it, and um, it's great to always hear of new new projects that are going on, and there's a lot of really good thinking about it. And in terms of ecosystem restoration, um, one thing that I'm really excited about is that the United Nations has declared the next decade, starting 2000, uh, 2021 to 2030, the decade on ecosystem system restoration. And, you know, on the one hand, you know, someone might say, yeah, the UN says this, the UN says that, but the people involved, I mean, this is, this is the time, and I think people know it. In Climate Week in New York in September, the most action was in the nature-based solutions venue. You know, there was just a lot of action, and the people who are running the, the de UN decade, they're talking about a mass movement. So, so watch out. Yeah, um, that is an ongoing challenge and something that, I mean, I guess, you know, personally I've gotten, despite having written a book called Cows Save the Planet, I've gotten a lot less pushback than I might have expected. Usually I get nice questions like that. Well, how, you know, what about methane or whatever? So what I talk about is a, a few things that, it's not that it's not the cow, it's the how. That, you know, it's, it's kind of cheap of us to blame animals for our failure to manage them properly. And I talk about the importance of having animals on the landscape. And we can talk about, I mean, how 
grazing animals created the deep soils that we have all around the world. In our continent, this was buffalo. Yeah, right, right. And to distinguish between, between industrial livestock and regenerative, holistically managed. Anyway, John, you were going to say something about that? Well, I, I think that um, actually there is a difference also between wild animals and domesticated animals. And there is a there is a co-evolution for grassland systems with animals. If you remove the animals, that's what Alan Sabre found out, sadly, that if you remove the animals, actually it doesn't make the landscape better. You need the animals in order to do this. But I think that, on the other hand, we have two other problems that we have to consider. One is this outrageous sort of um, feedlot industrial ag um, animal husbandry, and the other is grain production. So those two things need to be thought out quite carefully because they're terribly negative. So if we have grass-fed uh, holistic pasture management and maybe we're re re returning wild species, so go back to bison, go back to Wow, that's kind of better than the sort of way we're dealing with animals now. But I think that there needs to be a reduction in consumption mm -hmm. at this time because so much of this meat is coming from these um, industrial things. If all the meat was coming from 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 grass fed we probably still have a lower consumption than, than is what's going on now. So I think we probably need, we need, we need a, a nuanced, profound conversation about that. Yeah, that's a good, a good way to put it. Yes, we do. It's not a simple bumper sticker type thing. But often when people want to say that there's something you can do, stop eating meat. And people love to have something simple. But... Anyway, any more, any more questions? Um, so I don't know when it's coming out, and I can tell you what the working title is. It's This Good Earth, Dispatches from the Eco-Restoration Frontier. It depends how much editing it needs <clears throat> and, um, and how, how fast. So publishers, you know, like they've got their list, if it fits in. I'm hoping spring, okay? <laughs> you know, because... I'm anxious to get this out, for sure. Oh, well, hey, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, there's some incredible, incredible stuff happening when we start to work with nature. Right, right. Um, Michael Kropchek is one of the um, authors of the New Water Paradigm, right? And, and there are trees just like that Nama beetle evolved to procure its own moisture. Trees, like often at, in very, co and coastal areas sort of comb the moisture, like in the, in the, in the Northwest. Yeah, so, you know, just bringing, bringing together the, you know, the, the relationship between water and climate, I hope that that's more clear. And, you know, so I guess, Often, so we're dealing with a lot of predicaments here, okay? Climate change being a great big fat one. Sometimes I think it's the way that we talk about our challenges that interfere with our ability to do anything about them. So I think it's really important to kind of really open up how we look at our, our challenges to see what other aspects and to ask very basic questions like how does the earth manage heat? Because that gives you a different way in to the situation, the scenario and what we might and gives other possibilities for how we might work to augment those processes. Because we can, we have tremendous, tremendous leverage over the water cycle. Another way to kind of, someone who said this so well that I like to quote this, this is another Australian. Um, boy, those Australians are busy. Um, someone named Peter Andrews. I don't know if anyone has heard of him. He's a 
kind of maverick farmer, um, horse breeder. He developed something called natural sequence farming. And it involves working with the particular landscape, understanding that in the, the Australian landscape, they had these very shallow um, water areas that the, the water that you, need, that you were accessing might be kind of under the surface. So if, just a real understanding of the landscape. And he wrote two books. One is called Back from the Brink and Beyond the Brink. And I think they're really, really wonderful. Even though they're specifically about Australia, there's so many insights that can be applied anywhere, just to our thinking of how water and land work together. So what he says is, or in, in that in a, a quote that I pulled out of one of those books, is plants manage water, and in managing water, they are managing heat. And I think that's so powerful. Again, that's not the way we usually think about it, but it makes complete sense, and that gives us a lot of insight as to what to do. And he pointed out in that same passage that we have effectively devegetated 25% of the planet. So that's 25% of the planet that cannot mediate heat effectively, which is really devastating and a tremendous opportunity because we know what we can do. And then we have examples of by restoring the carbon cycle, we are restoring the water cycle. Yeah. and. I started thinking about this when I was I was still in the the carbon mindset and it hit me that we could draw all the carbon out of the atmosphere that we want and we will still have the floods and the droughts and the wildfires and all those scenarios that we attribute to CO2 driven climate change because they're, they're the result of, a, of other processes, of distorted water cycles. Yeah, so there is a lot we can do. Yeah, I love the, restora the examples of restoration because, you know, as we go on, there are more and more examples from different kinds of ecosystems, like a kind of broader um, library of possibilities to draw from. Thank you. <laughs>